And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra. I ho I hope everybody is getting. I hope everybody is having a having a nice drunken New Year's Eve at the time at the time of this recording, or if you're watching this on on Saturday, um, hap happy new happy New Year. Hope the future is doing all right. Time travelers here. Yeah, but and I I I would say Doc I would say Doc is here too, but I think he's too sober. <laughs> but it since we didn't do one last week, it's high, it's high time we do a bit. We do our fair share on it th on it this week. We are at the penultimate segment, not chapter, but just segment. When it comes to our journey through heavens and heresies, and in this instance, we are ha we are tackling something that is most cer is most certainly is most certainly been on the been on the list, and is and has especially and has especially especially something that was a case of dropping the ball in the in vanilla five e, and that is feats. Now, I had talked about this a bit a bit ago on Twitter, but my my assessment has always been the feat the feats as they were introduced in third edition were an evolution of the proficiency system that was tooled around with in AD and D second edition, and some of the motifs that were messed around with in skills and powers in said edition. Both ideas were undercooked. But the but the potential was there. But the the point is is that they were they were a means to personalize your give your given class your given um character beyond just your choice of race and class and spells. <laughs> into 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 something that wasn't going to be as cookie cutter. Now. I now yes. I have I have lambasted the way feat design worked in third edition and Pathfinder many times, all of them being deserved. Because even though even though on on print on concept the idea was sound, the execution left a lot to be desired. For two for, and the big reason for it is all the traps. I have frequently used Whirlwind attack as my whipping boy because of the ridiculous amount of prerequisites to get it. Just to do the equivalent of a spin attack you would see in any Legend of Zelda game be after the first. Or, you know, the more modern versions of spin to win in many popular MOBAs. Mm-hmm. On the on the other end, there were there were some there were some feats who, who, for the slot that they were in, were just useless, because they were just because they were just adding adding numbers to a specific thing. It's the reason why there's the meme of who the hell takes improved initiative. Which, uh, Darkness Rising then, completely you know, says the smart people do. Mm -hmm. And. To be fair, to be fair, I'm pretty sure somebody somebody could take my who take who takes improves initiative thing out of context and do a, and do a long winded rant, long winded rant about about who actually would take it. That would be miss. That would be completely missing the point. Yeah. The point is that is that um unless you have a specific kind of build in mind. A lot of feats were there as a distraction, and of, co and of course, e and of course, even with that, because of the way bo because of the way the whole bonus feat worked with the feater, you had to list off what counted as a bonus feat. This is why I this is why I speak so highly about the feat design in um, Fantasy Craft. Now, Five E's version of the feats was a optional alternative to ability score improvement. And 
I mentioned this earlier, but I consider this to be a masterclass in missing the damn point. Because <laughs> any way you slice it, most classes are go most classes are going to are going to only get some. In fact, I'd say most I'd say most classes period are only going to get four feats in their entire adventuring career if they go up that high. And since most drop off at drop off into the teens, good luck getting that high. Yep, it's an uphill climb exercise in futility. Would you say would you say that Sisyphus putting up pushing up the boulder? Uh, no, it's Sisyphus pull, pushing up the boulder when you make the uh, dead end trap choices amongst your feats. Now, I understand. I understand the whole notion of wanting to wanting to put in less feats because of the ungodly amount of feats that happened with um, third edition. But as I but as I said in my as I said in my sermon today, the pendulum swings both ways. And if you're going to have it where you uh, where you're only getting four feats, those four feats need to fundamentally change or fundamentally add to your sandbox. If you're not doing that, then it's a wash. And basically if they aren't uh, semi spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> or at the, or at the very least or at the very least giving you something interesting beyond beyond just beyond just a slight modification. Now, to be fair, there are some feats that do that, but that goes into the whole trap issue. And yes, some of those feats are specifically designed to dip in, to dip into other features, like say, spell casting or inv or invocations. Which, incidentally, until I um, I haven't been able to find a proper name for this, but things like the fighting styles for the fighter, or the or the invocations for the warlock, I'm considering the I'm considering these um, feats in all but name. I just need to find a way to make that a bit um, codified, because that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, you know. Yeah. Now, I know I've had the tradition of 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 getting Tanner's um take on on each thing that we've talked about each week, but unfortunately, I was an idiot this week and I forgot to I forgot to ask him until the last minute, so I won't have that. But if but if I do end up getting it after the recording, I'll put it in as a pinned comment. Yep. So, that's my bad. But with that in mind, let's get let's get to the festivities because we've got a lot of feats to cover. Indeed, we do. So, let's see, feats represent a character's specializations and play a large part in defining who a character is and what they're able to achieve. Get the we get a f get a few examples there. I'm skimming past that. Then we have our first dev note. So eventually, there will be an even split between feats that require specific core abilities. There will be the same number of feats that require con as that as there are that require dex as there are that require wit, etc. Right now, I've put the I put in the feats that I think should be in the game, which is a whole healthy list on its own. But wanted to note that eventually there will be balance between the requirements so as to make each core ability choice an even choice for players. Um, he wrote, and even choice for players, so I had to adjust that. Yep. Also, the goal with feats is to present relatively straightforward options to players. Do you want to be fully good with blade weapons? Pick blade, pick blade mastery. No other feat will make you as good with bladed weapons. Want to be the best with heavy armor? Pick heavy armor mastery. No other feat will make you as good with heavy armor. That sounds pretty standard, but we all know that it's not that it's not in a lot of games. Yes, in other games, there are always those odd feats like sentinel or great weapon fighting that make you better with a weapon than the feat dedicated to that weapon. 
The goal with Heavens and Heresies feats is to be honest with players and to make it clear exactly what they are getting. To be the best with great swords, you don't have to go down a long and convoluted feat chain where many of the feats have nothing to do with heavy weapons or swords, and a lot of time other games don't make those choices intuitive. Like what like what would a player know that GWF is going to make them way better than a sword with the feet than a sword with the feet that lets them specialize in swords? Instead, in Heavens and Heresies, you want to be the best with heavy swords. You pick the feats that make you better with heavy weapons. Great Weapon Mastery and Blades. Blade Mastery. That's it. Thinking over, you've done it. Now, as for which one to pick first, that's on the individual player. If the sword aspect is more important, pick Blade Mastery. If the heavy weapon aspect is more important, pick Great Weapon Mastery. Why other games don't run their perks slash feats like this, I don't... I'll never know. Um... I think in some cases it's pe it's people bogged down by tradition. Um, some pe some people. This is this is why I did that little musing about about the about the whole role playing bubble because it's something that doesn't just trap players; it traps designers. Mm -hmm. um, and why you don't ha why when it comes to people who are one system lifers, you don't see them reinvent that wheel all that much. Oh, but we have... We essentially have four meta types when it comes to feats. General, Martial, Spell and Ritual, and Ancestry. With the Ancestry, we have that in a, we have the, a bunch of different subtypes. Yep. We're going to start with General, which apply to skills and abilities. They may grant proficiency in skills or artistries, or they may allow a character to to general abilities, which do not apply either martial co ah, access to general abilities that do not apply to either martial combat or spell casting. And the first one we have is affable. You gain proficiency in persuasion. You get plus one to intuition defense, and you do not roll with disadvantage on persuasion checks unless you would receive disadvantage from at least two different sources this is your silver tongued salesman mm -hmm. aka me <laughs> uh, let's see alert you gain one tier of expertise in investigation you can add your proficiency bonus to initiative rolls if you would already add that you would instead get a plus two other creatures don't gain advantage on attack rolls against you as a result of being unseen. So this is your fuck you nit. This is your fuck off ninja. Mm. And all that requires is being proficient in investigation, which a fair few classes will get that right out of the gate. Let's see, animal. This... Go ahead. I was gonna say this rather than fuck you ninja. I was thinking more. Uh, I don't know why it popped in my head. I never asked for this. Adam Jensen, <laughs> you're thinking you're thinking of the typhoon. You're thinking of the typhoon, aren't you? No, I'm thinking of him grabbing people through walls. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as an aside, have you ever have you ever seen the short series um, Punch Punch Revolution? <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> second one made it. Second one decided to go with a RoboCop reference because, well, the first act is in Detroit. Of course, they did. Uh, next is Animal Wrangler. You gain plus two to animal handling checks. You may attempt an animal handling check as a 10-foot quick action rather than a 15-foot quick action. And once again, the only requirement is being proficient in animal handling. Prerequisites seem to be rather simple. Which is good for a general benefit. Yep. Next is Athleticism. Your carrying capacity goes up by one. You gain one tier of expertise in athletics, and when you're prone, you may stand up as a 5-foot quick action rather than a 20-foot quick action. Nice! So, you can carry more, and you get Ukemi. Better Ukemi. It says improved Ukemi. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And the only thing it needs is strength or dexterity as a core ability, and proficiency in athletics. 
which I'd say most martial classes are going to have proficiency in athletics out of habit. Probably. Mm -hmm. So next is Blind Sense. You gain Blind Sight up to a range of 10 feet. If you already have Blind Sight or gain it later, it grants an additional 10 feet. I always like when these kind of features future-proof themselves. Yep. So that if, it isn't empty. Yep. Uh, if you already have Blind Sight from another feature, or... Is this, la is this last sentence really needed? Because it's kind of repeating what's our, what's what's up here. So I'm... Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a copy of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Your blind sight can only work in a setting where your character can can use his or her other senses like hearing and smell. And all that needs is intuition as a core ability. Huh, sounds like my Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. Not only can do I not need to see you to kill you, but your magic is not going to work on me. Yeah. It's basic... Once again, this is a case of, of fuck you, ninja, because... If they're hidden from you, they don't get any benefit from it. Fuck you, I'm Batman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so next is Climber. Your climb speed goes up by 10 feet. You gain one vitality and one tier of expertise in athletics. So this Definitely. is like athleticism, but... You know, just for climbing. Mm -hmm. And all that it needs is strength as a core ability and proficiency in athletics. Let's see, next is Concentration. Increase your willpower by one, and you gain proficiency in investigation. Um, with Concentration, if you already if you already are proficient in investigation, does it is it going to give you one tier of expertise? Um, I think that's actually covered in the base mechanics pages, where it says if you already have proficiency in something, and something would give you proficiency, you instead gain one tier of expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's probably not necessary here. Yeah. I remember talking to Tanner about this mm -hmm. uh, last time we asked about something that was similar to this, and he's like, there should be a section already covering that in the base mechanics. Yeah. Um, resolve is re the only re prereq. Resolve as a core ability. Next Guts. We have, yeah, next we have um, Die Hard. Definitely Guts. Yep. Um... <laughs> Also, the the flavor text. Just a fly in the ointment, Hans. The monkey in the wrench. Uh, remember, everybody, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Mm -hmm. So your willpower, vitality, and resolve defense go up by one. And the only prereq is resolve as a core. Mm -hmm. But having your will, it may it may not sound like much, but the willpower and vitality part. Vital it's huge. It is, especially willpower, because that means that means one more that means one more shot that you can take when you're when you're when you're out of HP. Um, so then we have Dungeon Dweller. Increase your movement speed by five feet, which means more space for quick actions as well. You gain proficiency in investigation or history. And you can add a plus one to your initiative. Uh, not too, not too bad. And no, and no prereq. Let's see, next is durable. Your fortitude increases by one. And your damage reduction can reduce damage to one point of damage rather than two. Which, considering HP totals in this game, that's a lifesaver. Mm-hmm. All that you need is Constitution as a core. Let's see, next we have Enigmatic. Your Intuition and Wits Defense go up by one. You need... Oh, sorry, your Intuition and Wits go up by one. You just need one or the other as a core ability to get it. So, to make this perfectly clear to everybody, both Intuition and Wits Defenses go up by one. Mm -hmm. But you only need Intuition or Wits as your core, which means, again, my uh, my Inquisitor is looking very happy. Yeah. Except you can't tell it, because his face and body language are impossible to read. Mm -hmm. So, next is Expert. 
you choose choose a skill you have proficiency in, you gain two tiers of expertise in that skill. That's see, that's while while most of like we've complained about, you're just adding numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, getting tiers of expertise in a skill is actually quite useful for the things you use those skills for in this game. There's al there's also the f there's also the fact that even that um. The game, the game is not unless you unless you're blatantly going for a skill monkey build, you're not going to be getting tiers of expertise all that often. Unless you're playing a rogue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, which, in which case, in which case, it's kind of expected that you do. Yeah, I mean that's the skill monkey class. Mm -hmm. Let's see, so next is fortitude. Need constitution as a core to get it. You increase your constitution defense by one and your vitality by two. You know, I would like to say that having a feat called fortitude and an attribute called fortitude is slightly confusing. Mm -hmm. Especially when the feat called fortitude increases things that are not the attribute called fortitude. <laughs> So next we have half construct. When you take this feat, you gain the benefits of two of the following abilities. You may switch which two abilities you gain the benefits from after a rest, but may only gain the benefits of two at any one time. So you either get one point of damage reduction, one tier of expertise in a skill in which you are proficient. You can change your arm into a weapon, pick a weapon subtype with the light quality, you gain simple proficiency with this weapon subtype or martial proficiency if you already have simple. As a 5 foot quick action, you can change your arm into the chosen weapon or from the chosen weapon back into your arm. While your weapon is hit is hidden within your arm, you have advantage on any ability skullduggery checks to conceal it. You may change which weapon subtype to conceal after arrest but must own a weapon of that type. For example, if you choose Light Blade upon gaining this feat, you may, after a rest, replace it with a Light Axe, but must have a Light Axe in your possession. You lose proficiency, unless you already have it, when you switch weapons, but gain proficiency in the new weapon subtype. Or Dark Vision. You may ignore up to, up to four severity of the hidden condition caused by non-magical darkness. If you already have this feature, you may ignore two more severity. So, what you're telling me is my Inquisitor is now half magic robot. Um, although, given given the we given the weapon setup, you could ha Why do I get the feeling you'd go with um a cr a crossbow? Daka 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 daka, and you don't know it's there. <laughs> Why else, monk? They see a sword in one hand and nothing in the other. Fool them! It's a crossbow, motherfucker! Mm -hmm. <laughs> that rhymed and I didn't actually mean it to. And of course, with dark vision, well... Make your Sam Fisher jokes. <laughs> I mean, considering that I'm thinking of my Inquisitor as someone who stalks the night, hidden, hidden light crossbow in one arm... And, and and dark vision. I see you, duck. Oh, let me let me double check what 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 um your options are when it comes to light weapons. Pretty sure light crossbow is a light weapon. So let's see. So your your options your options are throwing axes, light axes. Throwing blades, light blades, light ranged weapons, light bo light bows, light cross light crossbows, light flails, light ma and light mass weapons, thro and throw throwing and throwing spears. Although you could you could have the hidden weapon be unarmed strike, but that would but that would be kind of pointless. I mean, unarmed strike. I already have, monk. Yeah. Um, I, my hidden weapon is already an unarmed strike without <laughs> being, without even being unsheathed. 
yeah, I'm, I'm, it'll be, it would be interesting to see how somebody would, would try and figure that out. Um, my hidden weapon is on, my hidden weapon is on armed strike. So what, so what you have a, you have a, what do you have? A, do you have a, um, do you have a gauntleted, do you have a gauntleted thing? No, I have a, no, I have a third arm in my back, like justice. Or, uh, or, um, <laughs> light, light throwing spears. <laughs> As your hidden weapon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to uncloak my arm. It's a spear. <laughs> Oops. Is my arm a spear gun now? No, you still have to throw it like a throwing. But hard Some interesting combinations there. <laughs> hard, to ig hard to ignore is next on our list. You gain one tier of expertise in persuasion. Creatures of your choice within 30 feet... <laughs> <laughs> of you are considered to be distracted hidden when they make ability investigation checks on anything other than you creatures which are immune to the compelled condition are also immune to this effect the severity of the condition is, bo is equal to your bonus to the persuasion skill and you have to have proficiency in persuasion although when it comes to that bo when it, since it says bonus I'm guessing that your proficiency bonus added in, adding into persuasion counts. I think so. That's probably what I would do. Um, next is quick reflexes. You gain ten feet of bonus movement. This movement can only be utilized to perform quick actions. So that's one free quick action if it's ten feet or less. And there's a lot of ten foot quick actions. Mm-hmm. You increase your wits defense or your dexterity defense by one. You need wits or dexterity as a core ability. All right. Next is helpful. You do not need proficiency in a skill in order to aid an ally in that skill. When you perform the help action on an ally, eight is considered the minimum roll on the d20 for a check they are attempting. A roll of one is still considered a one. I like this, because the reason nobody uses aid another is because all that it does is gr is grant a plus one. Mm -hmm. When you really think if you're if you're helping somebody out with a skill check, you should be doing a you should be doing a lot more than just a plus one. Oh. Yeah. So next is master harvester, something that grants you extra harvest, but not one per encounter because that's too good. Still working There's some... on this one. Yeah, there's some stuff on the side where uh, someone recommends maybe you can harvest refined resonance instead of raw to save weight. And Tanner responds, that's a good thought, or maybe the raw materials weigh one less or something since harvesting refined would be better than the pack rat feet a lot of the time. Maybe you can refine materials during a period of rest or something. That might be more balanced. So Master Harvester is still being fiddled and toyed with. Yeah, but at the very least, there's an idea. Yes. Mm -hmm. By the way, I I get I get the feeling that if you could if you could get away with it, you would have the you would have instead of a hidden blade or something like that, a hidden net. Nah, that's too fiddly. Well, just a bolo. That might work. Anyway. Motivate. Aren't you motivated? <laughs> After a rest, you may expend one vitality in order to motivate allies within 30 feet of you with one of the following effects. Plus one fortitude, a number of temporary hit points equal to twice your proficiency. These temp HP stack with other sources. Or plus one to attack rolls. These effects last until the next rest. If multiple characters use this feature's the same bonuses do not stack with one another, but characters can benefit from different bonuses at the same time. Well, get three guys in the party and have them all take Motivate. Again, aren't you motivated? <laughs> uh, let's see, and you need Intuition and or intuition or Resolve as a core ability and proficiency in History? Uh, I... 
don't see the reason for proficiency in history. Yeah. Maybe that's a carryover from an older DNA. Probably. Uh, so next we have Keen Mind, which increases your wit de wits defense by one, and a number of times per day equal to your wits modifier. You can roll with advantage on any wits-based ability check, or you may expend a use of this ability and impose disadvantage on an attack which targets your wits defense. Basically, your Keen Mind had prep time. Um, I know I I know I bitched about how about the whole a lot of a lot of features just granting advantage on something. The fact that you can impose disadvantage, and it's it's not a case of once once per short rest, like we, like we saw before, makes yeah. this makes this far more viable. More viable, and it still conforms to the balance that uh, Tanner has been seeing in his play tests. Mm -hmm. And it requires wits as a core ability. So next is linguist. You learn three languages of your choice. You gain one tier of expertise in history. You can create written ciphers. Others can't decipher a code you create unless you teach them. They succeed on a wits check, DC equal to your wits defense, or they use magic to decipher it. Why do I get the feeling our sommelier character would have this? Because he would. Just in case somebody tries to steal his scro his um, scrolls and then they can't read them. That and the fact that if he puts a cipher for the name of the scroll on the outside, and so nobody can read the cipher, so they just pick the one that has you know that looks like the right number of letters, mm -hmm. and they take it and they open the wrong scroll, which blows up in their face and eats them. Mm -hmm. That that's another thing. Yeah. So next is Lucky. Um, please no referencing one of the worst idiot reds in Sentai history. I wasn't going to reference him. You were going to I, reference I was... Dirty Harry. No, I was going to reference a pop song because that's where my head is these days. Anyway. You have two luck points. Whenever you make an attack roll or an ability check, you may spend one luck point to make the roll again. You can choose to spend one of your luck points after you roll the die, but before the outcome is determined, you may choose to keep your lucky roll or the previous roll. You can also spend one luck point when an attack is made against you and have the attack re-roll its attack. You may choose whether or not the attack keeps its roll or your lucky roll. If more than one creature spends a luck point to influence the outcome of a roll, the points cancel each other out. No additional dice are rolled. You regain your expended luck points when you finish a rest. The former yeah, is, some, is something we've seen before, but the latter is something we haven't seen as much. True. And just to, just to finish my reference, uh, who doesn't like Daft Punk? Because it's a good song. So, next is Observant. You gain two tiers of expertise in investigation. If you can see a creature's mouth while it's speaking a language you understand, you can interpret what it's saying by reading its lips. Unless it's wow. a lawyer. We don't, we don't talk about lawyers here. Oh. With you... It requires wits as a core ability and proficiency in investigation. Makes sense. <clears throat> Next is opportunist. You may take your turn immediately after an ally takes their turn, as long as that ally is not taking the first turn of the encounter. Requires intuition as a core. Rogues so, are probably going to take this. Rogues or uh, anyone who wants to immediately support... A, a uh, an ally that has intuition as a core, hmm. um, and that's the example of one of the things Tanner did clue us in on very early on: feats that play around with initiative order. Mm -hmm. So next is Packrat, aka every Elder Scrolls player ever. Oh, I didn't Packrat in Daggerfall. 
It's hard to pack Rat and Dagger Fall. <laughs> Okay, bet, better example. Every Diablo player ever. Okay, yeah, I'll accept that answer. Your carrying capacity increases by three. Requires strength or constitution as a core. It's pretty straightforward. You get three extra encumbrance. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next is practical alchemy. You gain proficiency in the nature skill. You may have the movement cost, rounding up to the nearest five foot, five foot, of quick actions taken to apply potions, poisons, or consume potions, and may administer a potion to a fallen ally as a quick action. Requires proficiency in alchemy. I'd say I get um I get tactics chemist vibes from this. Yeah, slightly. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see, next is Resilient. You gain proficiency in an ability defense with which you do not have proficiency. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward there. Yep. Let's see, next is Silent Step. You gained one tier of expertise in the Skullduggery skill. Conditions that would normally impose disadvantage on you while sneaking, do not do so unless you would gain disadvantage from two or more distinct sources. Characters that would normally have advantage when trying to detect you do not gain advantage unless they would gain it from two or more sources. And increase your movement by five feet. Requires core dex and skullduggery proficiency. Yeah. Let's see, next is Speak with Animals. You gain the ability to comprehend and verbally communicate with beasts. The language and awareness of many beasts is limited by their intelligence, but at minimum, beasts can give you information about nearby locations and monsters, including whatever they can perceive or have perceived within the past day. You might be able to persuade a beast to perform a small favor for you at the GM's discretion. Requires proficiency in animal handling and expertise in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the expertise part is warranted. Um. Hmm. Maybe not. But maybe there's a reason. Yeah. If if Tanner's got a reason for it, I'm 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 all ears. Let's see. Next we have Swift. Increase your movement by five feet. Gain one vitality. Gain one tier of expertise in athletics. Requires core dexterity and proficiency in athletics. Pretty straightforward there. Yep. So next is Swimmer. Increase your swim speed by ten feet. Gain one vitality and gain one tier of expertise in athletics. Only requires proficiency in athletics. Once again, straightforward. Then is tough. Your vitality increases by one. Your hit point maximum increases by an amount equal to your level when you gain this feat. Whenever you gain a whenever you gain a level thereafter, your hit point maximum increases by an additional hit point. And requ requires either resolve or constitution as a core ability. You know, tough in the, in in a lot of in a lot of editions of D and D. Is something that is never all that useful. I mean, you get you get a num you get you get HP equal to your le equal to your level retroactively. Whoopee! But in in this particular case, I'd say I'd say it's significantly more useful because of the lower hit point thresholds. Hmm. Uh -huh. And of course, getting getting one more point of vitality is is not is nothing to scoff at either. Yeah. Let's see, so next we have weight training. Your carrying capacity goes up by two. Whenever when you have encumbrance equal to half your carry capacity or below, you have plus five feet of movement, plus five feet of climb speed, plus five feet of swim speed, plus five feet vertical jump, and plus five feet horizontal jump.
So, <laughs> all that I'm all that I'm thinking of is the weighted armor meme from D from DBZ, and of course DBZ abridged. But I look at it as something that could be just as useful for people who aren't carrying the heavy loads. Yeah. Especially since it gives so many other movement benefits. Mm -hmm. Granted, it means you have to. It means you're gonna have to pack light. But if you're, say, the rogue, you're probably packing light as it is. Yeah. Let's see. And le and then we have well-rounded. You gain proficiency with two skills with which you do not have proficiency, artistries, or weapon subtypes. Or any combination of these. In the case of weapon types, you must choose a weapon subtype, such as one-handed blade or heavy bow, with which you are not proficient and gain simple proficiency. You may choose either nets or unarmed as your weapon subtypes. You can take this feat multiple times, but must choose different skills, artistries, weapon subtypes each time. Most of the time when you see this kind of thing, it's always just one choice. Here you get two. Which I do appreciate. Uh-huh. So then we get to martial feats. Now we're getting into the funner stuff. Not the fun stuff, the fun-er stuff. Funair. Mm -hmm. So we start with armor training. You're proficient with light armor and medium armor. Um, then we... St then we, then we have Axe Mastery. Increase the damage you deal with axes by one dice type. A weapon with a d12 damage dice gains plus one threat instead. And increase your threat range with axes by one. So, would that, me would that mean that a, d that a mm. d12 axe would get, a, would get plus two threat range in this case? Um. Mm, not sure. Let me t let me take a look. Yeah, martial da martial damage for great axes is D twelve, but this is one of those things that that um that might that could use a little clarifying. Either either yeah. way you're gonna be either way you're gonna be critting more. It's just are you yeah. gonna be critting by, by a factor of five percent or ten percent. Uh, requires proficiency with axes. If you have proficiency with some but not all weapons in this category, this feat applies only to those which you have it. Makes sense. Then we have combat endurance. When you enter into a threatening encounter, you gain an amount of temporary HP depending on your level. This temporary HP stacks with other forms, um, and it's basically five per tier, which not too shabby, and gain constitution as a core ability. Let's see, then we have blade mastery. Increase the once a, once a, which um, I was gonna say that all that the mastery feats act similar, but that's not the case because. With Blade Mastery, you step up the damage die or get or get threat. When you when a creature misses you, you can use your reaction to make an attack of opportunity with a blade you're wielding, and you get plus two to attack rolls with bladed weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Next is Bo well, Go ahead. I was gonna say a lot of the mastery feats are are basically Self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they all change a little bit depending on what you're talking about, but mm -hmm. you're gonna see a theme, people. Yep. So with bow mastery, increase the, once again once again the da once again the damage boost as a twenty foot quick action. You may increase the threat range of bow attacks you make this turn by three. Your ranged with light weapons with light range weapons increases by five each. Your range with light bows increases by 5 and 10, and 10 and 10 for your heavy bows. Which, talk about crit fishing. I could, um, yeah. Hey, you're, you're uh, the, uh, the, 
um, the the heavy armored disciples instead of using crossbows, it's using long long bows or heavy bows. Yeah. Of course, we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait until we see what crossbow mastery gives us. Mm -hmm. Is the the highest that you can do with martial damage with heavy bows is one d eight. Mm hmm. But the and the range that they have is thirty and sixty, so that's four, so that's forty and seventy feet respectively. Yep. Let's see. Next is Charger. You gain additional ten feet of movement. This movement must be used to move towards a threat. When you move at least fifteen feet in a straight line and then immediately make a weapon a melee or thrown weapon attack, the threat range for that attack increases by one, and you either gain a bonus to the attack's damage roll equal to your proficiency modifier if you cho if you choose to make a melee attack and hit or push the or push the target up to 10 feet away from you if you choose to shove and you succeed it i like the throw i like the um inclusion of thrown weapon attacks with the, with this kind of thing this is basically is basically boosting up bull rushing mm -hmm. uh but Especially because what because what you can have is some is somebody doing the somebody doing the what the wind up to the the wind up javelin throw. Mm hmm. Or in or in your or in your inquisitor's case, the hidden I'd say the hidden spear would still count. <laughs> I'm charging you. I reveal the spear and I draw. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if you have I'm not sure if you ever did javelin throwing. I did. Mm -hmm. Not uh with any amount of regularity, but I did. Yep. It, well, speaking it of is a workout. That that's what we have next. I love the I love the flavor text. Who needs spells when you have a crossbow? S friendly. <laughs> Let's see, increase the once again, damage boost. You ignore the loading quality of crossbows with which you are proficient. <laughs> ooh, ooh. If you have advantage on an attack with a crossbow and the lower of the two dice would also hit the enemy, or if you critically hit an enemy, you may add your ability modifier which, which, with which you, you made the attack to the damage roll. In addition, you may choose to push the enemy back up to 10 feet if it is large or smaller. And when you attack with a crossbow, you can choose to target strength instead of dexterity. Yeah, so our our oh, mount fuck? now our mountaintop temple of of heavy armor disciples with crossbows is really cooking with fire. Yeah, or well, gas. Yeah, and martial damage for crossbows is one d twelve. Yep, at the highest range. Yeah, if they've if if they've got mar if they've got martial proficiency on cr on um, crossbows, on he on heavy crossbows, that's one d that's one d twelve. So they'd get one threat range, ignoring ignoring load, so they can just keep so they can just keep firing because let us because for loading you have to spend a qu you have to spend both your action and ten feet and a ten foot quick action in order to in order to load. So. So by not doing that, they can just keep firing. <laughs> yep. It's like the it's it's like the it's like crossbows it's like crossbows combined with a speed loader. Or a crank crossbow, but even the even those I wouldn't consider speedy. Not really. Uh Let's see. Next is dangerous when cornered. While you have the dispirited condition, your threat range increases by two with weapon attacks, and you gain an additional two if you're attacking with disadvantage. I'd say I'd say that I'd say that's a good call. Uh, yeah. Requires resolve. Since resolve are going to be the do or die ones who tend to who tend to be on the front lines, this is a natural fit. Yeah. Uh, so next we have defensive duelist. So the so the Raphael school. 
Good lord, if you had to, good lord if you had to play against the Raphael main back in Soul Calibur 2. <laughs> Which, speaking as one, and everybody uh, hated me for it. Were you a cheapskate with him? No, I was a troll. Huh. But anyway, defensive duelist. When you are wielding... When you are either wielding a light weapon or wielding a weapon in each hand and another creature hits you with a melee or weapon attack, you may use your reaction in order to gain damage reduction equal to your proficiency bonus until the end of your next turn. This damage reduction does not stack with itself. Requires dexterity or wits as a core ability. Um, why do you get the feeling your Inquisitor would take this? I don't know. Why would my Inquisitor take that? <laughs> because it said a light weapon, not a light melee weapon. <laughs> See, so then we next we have dual wielder. You gain the benefits of two weapon fighting, f fighting style. Two weapon fighting. You gain plus one deflection when you are wielding a separate melee weapon in each hand. You can use two weapon fighting even when the one handed melee weapons you are wielding aren't light. You can draw or stow two one handed weapons when you would normally be able to draw or stow any one. Hooray! We have we have a form of two weapon fighting that doesn't suck ass. It's a Christmas miracle, even though Christmas is already passed. I think we can allow it. <laughs> so. I Look, look, I've, I've, I've had, I've had pages in the book of grudges for game for games that can't figure out how to do two weapon fighting and make it actually viable for people who want to do the dual wielder build. Mm -hmm. So next we have executioner. Once per encounter, after making an attack roll, you may increase your threat range for that roll by three. If doing so would cause you to crit. Oh, so it's a it's a post hoc crit. <laughs> post hoc ergo proctor propter hoc. Mm -hmm. I'd say this. I'd say I could I could easily see people using this if, if say they rolled they rolled an eight they rolled an eighteen. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see, so next we have fell handed. Which is basically our our um, mm. weapon mastery feat for mass weapons, and if I recall, mass weapons, mass weapons. So, martial great mass weapons have mm. D twelve for martial damage. Mm -hmm. Let's see, fell ha fell handed. You may choose to deal full damage rather than half when you miss with an attack with a mass weapon. This attack is considered is still considered to miss, but you do not gain combat focus. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, it is it is it is an ultimate case of still hit though. <laughs> still hit though. Mm -hmm. So next we have flail mastery, perfect for the black knight. You in increase damage with flails. You may increase the reach of flails by five feet. A ten, fo a ten foot flail that it wouldn't that wouldn't that be borderline a meteor hammer? I mean, all it reminds me of is the guard at the bottom of Hyrule Castle in A Link to the Past. <laughs> oh. When you score a critical hit against a creature with a flail, you may apply a severity of the stunned condition equal to your class ability modifier. And your damage rolls with flails ignore an amount of damage reduction equal to your class ability modifier. This really is for the Black Knight. Yep. Tis just a flesh wound. Mm -hmm. Let's see, so then we have Great Weapon Fighting. Oh, the, the feat that we picked on earlier tonight. <laughs> you gain the benefits of the Great Weapon Fighting fighting style. 
So as so as a fighting style, whenever you reduce a creature to zero hit points with a melee at attack, you may deal the excess damage to another creature. Okay, basically cleave. It's just yeah. you're d just you're dealing the leftover damage instead of ro instead of re-rolling. Before you make a melee weapon attack with a weapon that has the heavy property and with which you are proficient, you may choose to not add your proficiency to the attack roll. If you do so, you may add plus 2 plus your proficiency modifier to the damage roll if that attack hits. On a miss, you subtract your proficiency modifier from the total roll of the damage dice before dealing half damage. So, it's once again, it's a case of cleave and power attack in one little package. The fact that it's a fighting, the fact that it's treated as a fighting style, opens up a whole lot of opportunities that the original great weapon fighting doesn't. And incidentally, I I like the way um the the way these the way it's set up here. When it comes to when it comes to the power attack, instead mm -hmm. of instead of just a instead of just a number trade off like it usually is. So even with that, you do stick. You can still do, do the whole still hit though on on misses. Mm -hmm. All of the still hit though. All of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so next you have we have halt the retreat. When you are when you are wielding a ranged weapon, including weapons with the throne property. You may make an attack of opportunity against an enemy when it attempts to move further than 30 feet from you. If the range of your ranged weapon attack is less than 30 feet, a creature provokes an attack of opportunity when it leaves the normal range of your ranged weapon attack. This is essentially a, mean, a means to give snipers a chance to do AOOs. Well, it looks like uh, Dora will not be saying sniper no sniping today. <laughs> So next we have heavily armored. You gain proficiency with heavy armor and tower shields. And we have heavy armor master. Your movement increases by 5 feet even when not wearing heavy armor. The damage reduction granted to you from wearing heavy armor is doubled. Your weapon attacks deal an additional point of damage while you're wielding heavy armor. And your carrying capacity increases by two while wearing heavy armor. What, did you bring pockets into that suit? Probably. Uh, it just means you're adept at wearing and maneuvering that heavy armor. Mm -hmm. And let me take... So heavy arm... So let's see, when it comes to damage reduction, at the highest tier, that's, th that's three. So that's four. So four damage reduction, that's pretty good. Yep. Now next we have Light Armor Master. Your movement increases by 5 feet even when not wearing light armor. You get an additional point of damage reduction, which is good because um, light armor doesn't provide... Actually, actually never mind, it do light armor does provide DR, but not by much. Uh, you, get, you gain 1 deflection, which it, do which it does provide it a better amount. Mm -hmm. And your carrying capacity is increased by two. Yep. Let's see, then we have light weapon mastery. You gain advantage on checks to conceal weapons with the light property. This bonus does not apply to pole arms with the light qual with the light property. When you miss with an attack with the light weapon, the next attack you make with a weapon of the same type is made with advantage. You lose this advantage if you have not attacked by the end of your next turn. And you may ignore the encumbrance costs of up to two light weapons you are carrying. <laughs> Hel hello, broken-ass light crossbow that's concealed. Yep. <laughs> uh, so next is Mage Slayer. So you increase your resolve, wits, and intuition defenses by one. Spell attacks channeled with a spell focus against you are made with disadvantage if the caster is within your melee reach. And when a creature within your reach casts a spell with a spell focus, 
You can use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against that creature before the effects of the spell occur. If you make a weapon attack against a creature that has cast a spell in this round or, th or the last, or is in the process of casting a spell, your threat range increases by one for that attack. Requires intuition or wit's core. You're taking that, aren't you? <laughs> that's your inqui- that's your fe- that's- get that- that is almost tailor-made for Inquisitors. Yep. I figured I didn't need to say it anymore. Mm -hmm. It speaks for itself. Yep. Let's see, medium armor master is next. Increase your vitality for one, even when not wearing armor. The hit points granted to you from wearing medium armor are doubled. Jesus! You gain one deflection while wearing medium armor, and two carrying capacity. And medium armor, the highest that... So, at, at tier five, you would end up getting 50 hit points. Very nice! Oh, let's see. So next is mobile. Your speed increases by five feet. When you use dash, you ignore f up to four severity of hindering terrain. When you make a melee attack against a creature, you don't provoke opportunity attacks from that creature for the rest of the turn, whether they hit you or not. And you do not provoke an AOO from a creature if it is engaged in melee combat with one of your allies. This is tailor made for rogues and people mm. and, pe and people who want to mm. who love backstabbing. Mm hmm Let's see. Next is mounted combatant. You have advantage on weapon attack rolls against any unmounted creature that is smaller than your mount. Uh, get a bit get a big ass mount. <laughs> You can force an attack targeted at your mount to target you instead. While mounted, your mount takes more da well, your mount takes no damage rather than half when attacks miss it. If an attack would deal full damage even on a miss, your mount takes half damage. So essentially a better version of evasion. Yeah. Oh. Attacks to knock you off your mount are made with disadvantage. And once per turn, you may mount or dismount your mount as a free action. Doing so does not count against does not count as you or your mount taking your turn. So, once again, we have a case of something that would have been, that would have been a whole chain in other games being treated with just one thing. So, for those who want to do the cavalier approach, here you go. <laughs> Let's see, next, next is point blank shot. I'm getting bad vibes already. <laughs> When an enemy leaves your melee attack range, you may make an opportunity attack with a ranged weapon attack rather than a melee attack. Ranged, <laughs> ranged attacks against prone and against prone enemies do not impose disadvantage if you are within 30 feet. <laughs> your threat range for weight for ranged weapon attacks, excluding thrown, against enemies within five feet of you increases by two. Huh. I'm fighting somebody in melee with my hidden crossbow, and they run away. Mmm. Tasty. I do like that with, with this setup, um, we have, the, we have the fact that it's not just melee fighters that are going to be taking advantage of AOOs, which tends to be how it, all, how it more often than not happens. Mm -hmm. No, even, even, ranged, even ranged characters are going to be taking advantage. Mm-hmm. Next we have Polearm Master. I like pole arms. So boost the da boost the damage boost the damage by one type. The space within your reach is considered hindering terrain for enemies attempting to move within or through it. So a pole arm flourish. When you are wielding a pole arm, when a creature enters your melee reach, you may use your reaction to make an attack of opportunity against it with your pole arm. I'd say this. I'd say this would be a must for people who want to do um, board and poke. Yeah, very likely. Mm -hmm. oh. So next is Savage Brawler. 
When you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you may impose the severity of the afflicted physical condition equal to your class ability modifier to both yourself and the creature. <laughs> You're both afflicted physical. Mm-hmm. It's a ca- it's a case of who's got who, which of us has more pain tolerance. We're about to find out. See, next we have Sentinel. Creatures provoke opportunity attacks from you even if they take the disengage action before leaving your reach. When a creature within reach of a melee attack from you takes a weapon attack against a target other than you, you can use your reaction to make an AOO with that melee weapon instead of the attacking creature. And your threat range for for AOO you, you make increases by one. And it requires wits. I'd say that's a speci- that that goes especially well with polearm boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, so next we have sharpshooter, which grants the sharpshooter fighting style. And for that one, you can you may spend a ten foot quick action in order to have the next attack you make this turn at long range. <laughs> Not impose disadvantage, as a t- or you can have it ignore any severity of the hidden condition granted by cover. I'm just gonna shoot right through your fucking cover, cause fuck you. And before you make a ranged weapon attack with a ranged weapon, but not a thrown weapon that you're proficient with, you can choose not to add your proficiency to the to the attack roll. Basically, basically, sharpshooter can grant a ranged version of power attack. Oh. Let's see, then we have Shocking Blow. When you kill a threat on your turn, you may, as a as a ten foot quick action, designate one enemy of the same challenge rating who witnessed the death. The designated enemy is compelled with a severity equal to your class ability modifier. Oh, so Oof. so taunt. Well, compelled, so it's a little bit more than taunt. It's you've scared the shit out of them into doing what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I can see barbarians taking that. Considering it re- it requires either resolve or strength, yep. Mm-hmm. I can see them having it too. So, skulker. You can try to hide as long as, as, long as you are hidden to or above. You gain one tier of expertise in the Skullduggery skill. You may target a creature's strength, dexterity, or constitution defense with an attack that would normally target a different physical defense as long as that creature is unaware of you. When you are hidden from a creature and miss it with a ranged weapon attack, making the attack doesn't reveal your position, and your threat range increases by two against creatures who are unaware of you. Of course. That's a perfect assassin set of, of, of feet abilities there. Mm-hmm. Let's see, next is shield training. Gain proficiency with light shields and standard shields. Um, next is shieldsman slash shields maiden. I think we already... I th- didn't we already cover this particular fighting style? We covered the fighting style, but this is a feat, mm-hmm. isn't it? Or is it just a feat that it's covers... A feat that, the... It's a feat that grants the fighting style. Yeah, we did. We did discuss the fighting style, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure if everything here is just the fighting style. Well, we have the fighting style in front of us. Once per turn, you can utilize a 10-foot quick action to grant allies within five feet of you plus one deflection until the beginning of your next turn. If multiple creatures utilize this feature, it stacks up to plus two. Smart move, given some given the cross given the crossbow chain that we've. Um, devised. Uh-huh. For light shields, you can wield a two-handed weapon without penalty. If you're wielding a two-handed weapon, you in- you gain plus two deflection instead. For standard shields, if you aren't in... Um, your strength and dexterity defense is increased by one, and you gain one DR. For tower shields, you are no longer restricted to wielding light weapons, and it no longer reduces your movement. You also get plus two deflection... And and one dr. Um, even if you can't do the whole chain thing, the amount of deflection you can get from this is 
um, is amusing. And of of course, of course, both, of course, all three, all three of them can result in some crazy equipment setups. Especially the idea of someone having a great sword and a light shield. <laughs> this party's just getting started. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Next we have thrown weapon expert. Increase the range of thrown weapons by a number of feet equal to your strength or dexterity score. Round up to the nearest um, five feet. Uh, and he does. Cl Someone asked about about does about um how does this affect the normal disadvantage ranges? Ba it increases both. It's you deal plus one damage with thrown weapons. You may draw a stowed thrown weapon as a free action. So start spamming those start spamming those spears. And your thrown mm -hmm. weapon attacks ignore a severity of the hidden condition granted to a target from cover. Indeed. So, yeah, that's your, that's for that's definitely gonna be for people who like to sp who like to bring all the thrown weapons and just spam them. Yo. Uh, let's see. So next we have solid defense. You gain plus one to your strength or constitution defense. While fighting defensively, your highest physical defense is increased by two. Inter interesting, since fighting defensively isn't is something that you'd actually want to do here. Let's see, then we have tactical advantage. Not to be confused with tactical genius. That's a different story entirely. Mm -hmm. You gain plus one to attack rolls made against targets who are within melee reach of one of your allies. And your attacks have plus one threat range against targets who are within melee reach of one of your allies. Um, this is this is built for that fighter chain we did. <laughs> <laughs> so this we have Trapper. Your nets gain physical defenses equal to your class ability defense. Ooh. Once per turn, you may throw a net as a 15-foot quick action rather than as an action. Net and nets in inflict additional severity of the hindered condition equal to your class ability score. Uh huh. And let me let me see something when it comes when it comes to nets. Okay. So normally nets inflict hindered two. And the net has a physical defense of 10. Yeah. But if it's, if it's at your if it's at your ability defense, that's where things are going to get interesting. And if you've got if you've got 5, if you've got 5 in your class ability score, then yep. it's Oh, sorry. I should I should reflect. For simple damage, it's hindered two. For martial damage, it's hindered three. So yeah. that's hindered eight. Yeah. So they ain't moving anyway. They ain't moving for a while. Not that they want to. Mm -hmm. So next we have unarmed mastery. Drunken boxing, mm -hmm. maybe. Let's see. Boosts unarmed strikes. If you have at least one free hand and hit with a melee weapon attack, you may grapple a creature as long as that attack would also hit a creature's strength or dexterity defense and the creature is within reach of your free hand. In addition, if the creature is at least one size category larger than you, you may mount that creature. It has disadvantage on attack rolls against you and disadvantage on checks to escape the grapple. The creature may move as normal if you mount it. And you have advantage on attack rolls against a creature you are grappling. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say drunk I wouldn't say drunken fist. This is more of um, MMA fighter. Yeah. Uh, kind of, kind of reminds me of some of the of some of the fighter powers that were in Martial Power Two, that were all yeah. all about open all about open hand, just so you can grapple. And now you've got now you got a meat shield. Yeah. Um, 
In your case, why do you get the feeling that you would use this to do unarmed attacks and then suplex someone? Suplex! <laughs> Let's see, then we have Weapon Master. With a quote from the Disciple of the Perfected Soul. A weapon is merely a mark upon our bodies resembling that which is upon our souls. Your carrying capacity increases by two. You gain the following benefits while ma while make while wielding a weapon with which you have the corresponding prerequisite feat. Your threat range increases by one. And you need a. F the question that I have is: Do you need all of those? Ma do you need all of those masteries, or do you need only? Do you need only? I'm guessing it's probably all of them. Uh, with which you have the corresponding prerequisite feat. I think I think you need at least one. Yeah. But when it says the following, when it says the following benefits, I get the feeling that there's going to be more um, benefits than just increasing threat range. Mm-hmm. But that's that's just that's my that's my vibe. Then we have weapons training. Choose two weapon subtypes, such as light mass weapon or great blade, with which you either do not have mm. proficiency or only have simple proficiency. You mm. gain simple proficiency with those types if you do not have proficiency with them, and martial proficiency with those types if you already have simple proficiency with them. You may <coughs> instead choose one weapon subtype with which you do not have proficiency and gain martial proficiency with it. Oh. Uh. And increase your vitality by one. Oh, very useful things. Yeah. Once again, a lot of times, a lot, a lot of those training feats usually would be case of one, of one per. Yeah. Even we, even we have that kind of thing. Although yeah. I'd, I'd say we ha I'd say we've got better justification for it. We have a big justification for it. Mm -hmm. But I'd say, I'd say that. In, this is there was a rare instance of me saying what the fuck for once, especially <laughs> when it comes to some of the builds. There's, there's some build. I I do want to make clear that even though I've said some builds are 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 very much leaning to some, to certain classes, that doesn't mean that you have to take them for those classes. It's just they would probably complement certain playstyles in those classes the most. And mm -hmm. the Inquisitor jokes, well. Zan's going for a very specific Inquisitor style that isn't going to fit everybody. <laughs> and even then, not all of them are likely to, to come to fruition. There's there's an idea in my head, and maybe I'll go for a, cyb a, a magic cyborg, or maybe I won't. Mm -hmm. Only time will tell. Yeah. I do... If there's one particular addition to the, to the combat feats that, that I think we do like... It's the as I mentioned before. It's the fact that ranged characters can participate in attacks of opportunity just as much as martial characters can, which yeah, I believe that was in um, either third edition or Pathfinder, but it's buried in some. It was buried in some of the splat, and I do not have the patience to dig through that. I can promise you that. <laughs> no. No splat digging. Yeah. Now. We're in a in a first for us. We're going to cut it off at the halfway point, because there's going to be a lot of feats when it comes to ancestry and a lot of stuff when it comes to spells and rituals. So we'll be doing a part two la later on before we get to the final part, that being the encountuary. And yep. hof and hopefully by then I'll be able to cover my ass regarding my bl regarding my blunder earlier this week. <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to get the text from Tanner. <laughs> But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, happy fucking new year, and stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>